Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for another version of National Museum of Industrial History's Virtual Museum. Today, we're doing a talk with an MHS historian for the first time called Little Trains for Big Steel uh, with Mike Piersa. As I mentioned, Mike is NMIH's historian. He graduated with a bachelor's in history from Moravian uh, College and a master's in history from Lehigh University. He's actually been with the museum in some capacity for over 17 years and has been instrumental in the research and in interpretation behind our collections. Uh, so if you've been to the museum, Mike is behind a lot of what we've done. You've seen our cordless uh, steam engine in operation. He's behind the restoration of it. Um, so he's done a lot of very important work for the museum. We're happy to have him here today. Um, I also want to talk about a couple of the other ways that you can help the museum right now. Obviously, we're doing all these great programs for free on online. Uh, if you go to our website at nyh.org, there's a couple of different ways that you can help the museum, whether it's um, adopting an artifact, purchasing something from our online gift shop. Uh, if you're ordering things from Amazon, you can utilize Amazon Smile and get um, part of your purchase goes towards helping the museum. And there's a few other ways that you can help. Um, so if you'd like to go and check that out, if you're able, uh, nmih.org, uh, you can find out how to help us right now uh, while we're obviously closed. And if you're joining in today, we also have a lot of other programs that we've already done. Uh, you can see the recorded versions of those on our website. And if you also go on and check out, we have some upcoming talks coming as well. Uh, Mike is joining us again on Friday for a talk about iron versus steel. And we also have a professor from Stanford University who's joining us on uh, Monday for a talk called Quakers, Guns, and the British Industrial Revolution. Um, so please, if you're if you're into history, check those out as well. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mike, who has this uh, great and interesting presentation on uh, our locomotive for you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Glenn. Um, this is my first time live streaming, so hopefully this will go smoothly. I'm going to try switching over to uh, uh, screen view so you can actually see what's on my screen. It's going to take just a moment here. And it's going to upload a small slideshow uh, talking about narrow gauge in general. So the files are just uploading real quick right now. They should be here momentarily. And as we watch this, uh, record any questions you might have. Uh, Glenn will read them to me at the end of the presentation. I can't actually see those questions myself. And if anybody here actually worked for the narrow gauge or knew anybody who worked on the Bethlehem Steel narrow gauge, feel free to let us know. We'd love to talk to you. What you're seeing here is just a short, short snippet of uh, what we have. So there's a lot more that we can go into and there's also a lot more to learn. But to get started, we're gonna go back all the way to the 1500s and we're gonna look at this illustration. So if you look at this drawing here, this is uh, from Diderot's De Re Metallica. And it shows the first illustration that we know of of a narrow gauge piece of railroad equipment. And this was used in the mine. Uh, the guys who were using it probably didn't think much of it. It's just a simple push cart on four wheels that runs on rails. But you fast forward into the 20th century, and guess what? You're using the exact same thing here at Bethlehem Steel, except it's just a little bit heavier. Narrow gauge railroads were used all over the place. This particular shot shows almost the entire length of track, which is about, I'm guessing, 30 feet inside the blowing engine house of Bethlehem Steel. They used uh, little transfer cars like this to transfer material from one crane run to another. Um, so all they had to do was literally just go uh, from one side of a column uh, to the other so they got the next crane could pick it up. And there are probably dozens of cars throughout the plant just like this. But the mainstay of our talk is a larger narrow gauge system. And for those who don't understand what narrow gauge is, this image should explain it fairly well. Uh, what you see here is a big standard gauge gondola car. Uh, you can see the uh, gas cylinders in the gauge of the track. Those rails are four feet, eight and a half inches across. Uh, which is standard for most trains. If you look at Norfolk Southern driving by Bethlehem Steel today or Amtrak, those are all standard gauge trains riding on the same rails, all interchangeable across the country. But if you look just to the right of this image, you'll see a little switch and a pair of tracks that's much, much narrower. Um, and you'll under start understanding why these narrow gauge railroads were popular in steel mills. Steel mills 
even early on, uh, like the ironworks, they evolved from very crowded places. So if you look at the size of those big train cars and think about how tight of a turn that they can make, uh, you really can't make a sharp corner with those things. So if you want to turn around inside the building with a big train car, uh, odds are that's just not going to happen. You need a smaller train to handle those uh, smaller buildings. And the smaller trains, you can do things with them, like put them up on a second floor. That means you have much less trestle work and bridge work and become a lot more economical to use. That's why narrow gauge railroads still have a handful of niche places where they're actually still in use in industrial settings. So moving on, we'll take a look uh, at some of the earliest narrow gauge operations in Bethlehem. So Bethlehem Iron Company started in 1863. In 1873, they began making steel. So this is an image showing the inside of a Bessemer steel making shop. In this particular view, you can see three Bessemer converters. These took liquid iron and turned it into steel. We'll discuss how that actually happened in a later talk. But for the narrow gauge portion of our talk, what's interesting is you can actually see the narrow gauge pieces of railroad equipment in here. You can see at the front of the image, there's a little four wheel cart. And just like that image from the 1500s, there's one guy pushing it around. And then in the background, you see another cart that's holding the bottom of one of the converters. And what's a little bit harder to see, but still present, is there was actually about uh, 75 feet of railroad track that a locomotive would push a flat car on that held a ladle. And this ladle would go from the cupola furnaces, which melted pig iron, uh, turn it into a liquid form. This ladle would uh, be moved by the locomotive about 75 feet to these converters. And then there was a hydraulic lift that would pick up the ladle and fill these converters with liquid iron, which would be converted into steel. And then the narrow gauge railroad also handled the ingots. Uh, those would be taken to a rolling mill inside the same building. And for those of you familiar with the Bethlehem Steel site, this is the big building that they call the Iron Foundry today. That was its last use. And also the ruins, because this was one continuous building 931 feet long when it was originally built with stone arches and the slate roof. So this is just another view inside that Bessemer converter shop. You can see a ladle of iron that has already been converted into steel. They're pouring it into ingots, and these ingots are down in a pit. And if you look really closely, you'll see these little ears on the top of those ingot molds. Um, and you'll understand this process a little bit further on as we uh, go into the presentation. But those ingot molds would be filled with liquid steel. It would solidify. And then the steel would be taken down to a rolling mill where it would be squeezed out between giant rollers like your rolling dough and a rolling pin and transformed to the steel rails and later on other steel products. So this is a shot of one of the early narrow gauge locomotives. If you look at it, uh, you can see uh, from the size of the guys that this thing was tiny. This is the kind of train you'd see like at an amusement park or a coal mine. It was uh, very diminutive. This was number 10. We've seen locomotive numbers as high as 15. And we're still working on an all-time roster of the narrow gauge. But they really had an entire fleet of little trains. Now, most of us uh, who are around in the 20th century would recognize these trains if you worked at Bethlehem Steel or even drove by as working in the open hearth department. So this is a shot of a typical open hearth shop. You could tell them apart from other furnaces because it was one long building and you had multiple smokestacks. You could see an entire row of smokestacks all on the same side of the building. And each stack, uh, or each pair of stacks were responded to a, a furnace inside there. So if you entered inside the shop, this is probably what you would have seen. Uh, there's a, a ladle full of liquid steel, sorry, liquid iron being poured into the furnace here where the iron would be converted into steel. And these types of furnaces could also use scrap metal. And that's what the narrow gauge railroad that we have in front of the museum specialized in. So you can see this guy standing in front of a pair of rails. That's uh, uh, what the railroad uh, would run on. You can see them better in this overhead view uh, from the Inland Steel Company. So you see the furnaces on the left. You have one, two, three. It looks like four furnaces visible in the view. And directly in front of them is a little uh, narrow gauge railroad. And you see these things uh, that look like bathtubs with a funny looking shape at the uh, right hand end of them. 
those things are called charging boxes. And uh, you would fit on a typical train car, maybe four charging boxes on a car. And then there's a machine called the charging machine that ran on a broad gauge set of railroad tracks, which might be 20, 25 feet apart uh, between the rails. It's electrically powered. That's what that funny arm coming off on the right is for. That's to get the electrical power from a, a, a takeoff a rail. And then the electric power operates this charging machine, which is kind of like an overhead crane in its function. I mean, this is a whole lecture in itself, but it has an arm that moves forward and backwards, and it picks up these, box, these bathtub-like boxes from these railroad cars. The boxes are filled with scrap metal, and it lifts them up just a little bit, pushes them inside the furnace. All of the doors on the first three furnaces are closed, but in the back furnace, it looks like the doors are open. Uh, they would just have the immense amounts of light coming out of them when you open these things up because you had literally uh, yellow, white hot steel inside of those things. That would pick up this charging machine, would pick up those little boxes, put them inside the furnace, spin them upside down, empty them, and immediately pull them out and go from car to car, filling up the furnace like that. So, this is a good uh, uh, thing for you guys to comment on. What do you think they're actually loading up into these, this furnace right here? This was taken a little bit after World War II at one of Bethlehem's West Coast plants. Um, the bottom line with this stuff is if it was made of metal, they can melt it down. So why don't you see if you can figure out what they're melting down here and uh, we'll review it at the very end. So if you notice that scene from the open heart, it looks not all that different from the electric furnace shop, which is what you see in this image here. This is uh, taken in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in the old uh, electric furnace melt shop which was originally the open hearth uh, number one, built in the late 1880s. This building is gone now, it was demolished in 2008. But they took the old open hearth shop, upgraded it starting in the 1930s and put in electric furnaces. And these particular furnaces use that same charging system. We see the pile on the right with those bathtub-like boxes that would be put on the cars on the left, moved by the locomotive. And then the charging machine would fill them up inside the furnaces. Now, all of this is happening on the second floor of the building. Uh, on the other side of the furnace, there is a deep uh, pit, which is actually ground level in most places. And this is what's happening with the furnace. You're pouring out the liquid steel. This would be about eight to 12 hours, depending on the furnace, after you started uh, filling it up. Uh, the steel has a big ladle here, and uh, some of the metal is skimming off into a slag pot because the slag, which is the impurities in the metal, float to the top so they can be uh, floated off and separated. And after you do that, you're left with this giant ladle full of liquid steel. In Bethlehem, those ladles were about 87 to 94 tons in capacity. And as our refractory lining wore away, which is a refractory brick that kept the metal shelf from melting, uh, the capacity would increase a little bit. So once this ladle got up in the air, being lifted by a giant crane, it would come over to another set of railroad tracks at the lower level of the facility. And you can see in here, there is an entire train full of what they are called ingot molds. Uh, these are hollow boxes made of cast iron, sitting on top of what they call stools, which are on top of the railroad cars. And these big open top boxes would be filled with liquid steel. And then uh, the steel would solidify. This is another view of them, uh, what they do, they're called teaming the ingot. So it was a very spectacular operation. The guy on the left wearing the protective suit operates a stopper rod, which controls the flow of the steel. And if everything works smoothly, he could open uh, the valve, uh, let the steel flow into the mold, close it, and move from ingot mold to ingot mold, filling them up with steel. This is another view here. You can actually see the railroad cars down there. So you have two ingot molds per car. And this uh, has been a practice that went on for decades. Uh, you can see this uh, image from uh, the Edgar Thompson works in Pittsburgh with the steam locomotive pushing around the ingot cars. You can tell these cars are different from the cars that we have in use at the museum because our cars are charging cars. They're much lighter weight and they have open sides. You can see the bearings on the wheels. Here, you can't actually see the wheels on the cars. They were built to be protected because when you're pouring the molten steel, you are liable to have spills and have uh, 
liquid seal fall on your railroad wheels and get frozen and solidify is going to be a real mess and you won't be able to move your train. So the more you can protect those wheels, the better. So that's an easy way to tell these ingot mold cars apart. Uh, this is a shot from Bethlehem Sparrow's point plant. Instead of covering the bearings with a shield, they put the bearings on the inside of the wheel set. And you can see uh, there's multiple cars in the train, two locomotives. What's special about this is you have a cow and a calf set. So you have one locomotive with a cab on it and a second locomotive where the cab was removed and it's controlled remotely from that first unit. So in effect, you have two locomotives in one. This is another view from Sparrow's Point. So you get an idea of what the workers themselves look like. This is back in uh, probably the days of uh, seam judging by the cab uh, arrangement. And now we're here at uh, the ingot stripping facility. So those ingot molds would be lifted up over the ingots that had solidified beneath them. Uh, the molds would be put onto another train, taken back into the mill and filled, filled up again. Then the ingots themselves, you can see another view here showing how much different they look after the mold is removed, would be glowing like orange hot. And the entire train full of these orange hot ingots would make its way down the railroad track go along the curves wherever they had to go from the ingot stripper building to uh, the soaking pits, which was usually not too far away. Sometimes uh, if you didn't need an ingot right away, it would be put into storage. So that's what you can see here is a narrow gauge railroad train with a stack of ingots and they would stockpile these and reheat them later for a rolling at a future date. But if things were going smoothly and production was high, the goal was to get the ingots from the train into the soaking pits. Uh, soaking pits are a place where they would soak in heat to a uniform temperature. You'll see an ingot uh, uh, moving moved into the pit, and then they're sitting in this uh, giant pit, literally full of heat. If you go up to one of these, you almost have to shield your face. It's so intense. But this brought the ingots up to a uniform temperature inside and out. Then they were pulled from the pit and taken to the rolling mills and squeezed into steel beams, rails, and all sorts of products, you name it. So that pro uh, process is still used on a very limited basis uh, with ingots uh, for specialized applications, but most of this has been taken over by continuous casting. Uh, so a lot of people here about Bethlehem might have installed a continuous caster and lengthened life of the plant. That's what uh, modern mills like Steelton, uh, Burns Harbor, Coatesville, basically anybody who's in business today and doing large scale production uh, of the same basic type of product over and over, day in and day out. They're using a continuous caster, which emits the trains and emits the ingots. It goes straight from molten metal uh, to a uh, bloom that comes out of a machine and you can start rolling it. Much more efficient. So the locomotives in the museum collection are number seven and number 21. We're gonna start here with number seven. This is how we found it inside the electric furnace melt shop. You can see the electric furnace behind it with a few electrodes sticking straight up. And you can see it very well that this is on the second floor of the building. And for those of you who drove by the plant from late 90s until 2008, you could actually see this locomotive from Third Street. And if you got just in the right spot before that, you could actually see these trains running. And I know some people out there have actually taken video of them running uh, from public streets. So at some point, we'd love to get some copies of those as I know it's out there with you guys. This is our other locomotive that's not currently on display. This is locomotive number 21. This was used in open hearth number three, which was located in the parking lot uh, between the steel uh, skate zone and uh, steel stacks along the uh, riverside. Uh, this was later used as a shop switcher at the Philadelphia, Bethlehem and New England Railroad locomotive repair shops. That company was uh, taken over by Lehigh Valley Rail Management and Lehigh Valley Rail Management in 2007 donated this locomotive to us. And they also uh, have got it running for us. So this is a shot uh, taken in 2007 uh, when the trackage was still in place. If you would still, if you were going to the spot today, you'd be probably about in the lobby of the hotel today. This is a shot inside the building showing Jake Jacobson. He's uh, He died several years ago, but 
him and Barry Kovacs were the guy who helped to get this locomotive running back in 2006. It's been in, in, it's been in indoor storage ever since then. And once we move it out to our railroad, we think it won't take much to get it running again. So our railroad in front of the museum uh, was built in 2015 as a donation by CPS Railway Services. They do a lot of work for our steel mills in the Coatesville area and uh, the local short line railroad. So they laid track with 110 pound rail, got us a uh, number six uh, turnout uh, they acquired from uh, the Coatesville area. And we started moving equipment into place. This is uh, us loading up uh, one of the charging cars, which we had stored inside number two machine shop. You can see some of the charging boxes on the left. This is our volunteer team. Uh, as we installed the uh, cars into place, got them on the tracks, uh, got them lubricated, and began the restoration process of the locomotive. The cars themselves really didn't need much other than uh, lubrication. Um, these were the kind of machines that if you ever painted them, the paint would burn off as soon as the flames from the furnaces hit them. They're built incredibly durably, so even though the way they are, uh, they probably last hundreds of years uh, out in the weather. But the locomotive itself, uh, the company painted those orange. That was uh, the company color for mobile equipment. So we noticed that the paint was in fairly rough shape, so we uh, reprimered it, added a fresh coat of paint on it, and we did it the way Bethlehem still would have done it. It's not a first class body shop restoration. It says the old workers uh, would describe reached the windows, put the paint on it, and uh, the company was happy. So it is historically accurate in that regard. After the mechanical restoration was complete, sorry, after the cosmetic restoration was complete, we moved on to the mechanical side of things. Some pieces like the traction motors were actually in uh, good shape. They really didn't require much attention at all. But other pieces like the electrical generator did need some work. This is a commutator right here. You can see it's a, uh, fairly dirty, a little bit corroded, or maybe it's just a mixture of particulate that particles that fell on it, but at the rate we cleaned it up uh, really well. And moving on, we did the same thing with the electrical controller. There is a multitude of brass fingers in here that have to uh, mesh with corresponding parts. So again, it wasn't uh, a whole lot of new parts. It was really a lot of grunt work going in there and cleaning this stuff up and making sure it worked properly. Uh, we did have to put a new alternator on the engine. The engine that you see in there is probably a replacement we're guessing from the 1950s. It's a Cummins six cylinder engine, um, HR6B type, produces 150 horsepower. It drives a generator, and then the generator drives a pair of traction motors. And this is all DC power, and the electrical equipment is from Westinghouse. The actual locomotive was built by Whitcomb in Rochelle, Illinois. And uh, it was uh, dated 1941. That's the same year as our sister engine two. So we really have a good representation of World War II and modern, well, at least 1995 when the plant shut down, uh, still making narrow gauge equipment. So right before the virus hit, our volunteer Bill Stone took the windows out because the wooden window frames had been rotting way over the years. And he actually built brand new window frames in his woodworking shop. So as soon as we're allowed to get back to work, those things are gonna go back in the locomotive. And uh, we look forward to a, a season of uh, being able to demonstrate it for the public. At this point, I think it's a good time for Glenn to show the video of it actually in operation. And after that, we can start taking some questions. All right, thanks, Mike. Let me uh, get our video up here. Okay, I think everybody should be able to see that. So this is a quick, uh, like two minute, uh, two and a half minute clip of the engine running. Um, so you guys can see what it looks like and uh, see it in operation after we, we first uh, debuted it, so.
All right. Oh, whoop, hold on a second. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that little video. Uh, we do have a couple questions from uh, from a couple of people that were writing in. Um, Mark Graves asked, "Is the short video available anywhere?" Um, that video, I will post a link to it in the comments. Um, but if you go through our uh, Facebook page in the videos, uh, it's in there as well. Um, but Mike, got a couple of questions for you that I'll start reading off. Um, someone asked, did the ingots ever topple over on the train? Yes, they did. The ingots fell over, the locomotives derailed. If you look at uh, Locomotive 21 very carefully, you can see spots in the cab roof where uh, they identified it. And if you look at the locomotive, you'll also see lifting lugs on it uh, because they would actually come up with a crane and pick these things up, or they would bring in Bigfoot, which was a nickname for their forklift. And uh, the forklift uh, would uh, be able to lift the locomotive too. Hmm. Uh, somebody else asked if there, there are, I think, two questions about this. Um, someone thought there might have been parallel tracks that were standard uh, next to the narrow gauge. And someone else asked if everything in the plant was uh, narrow gauge or if it was mixed with standard gauge. So in some places, uh, like the locomotive repair shop, you had one track that was narrow gauge, what other tracks that were standard gauge, uh, another track at least that was dual gauge. Dual gauge means that there was a third rail inside the standard gauge, so the narrow gauge trains could run on the inner two rails, and the broad gauge train could run on the outer two rails. Uh, so dual gauge was fairly common in the plant. If you look next to the old Coldron building, which is the building just south of ArtsQuest, uh, you can actually see, still see about a block of dual gauge uh, rail embedded in concrete there. Hmm. Uh, combine the uh, Philadelphia, Bethlehem, and New England Railroad trackage, which was a wholly owned subsidiary railroad. There was about 150 miles of standard gauge track in the plant. Uh, the narrow gauge trackage was much uh, shorter because it was, it was primarily used for shorter runs. Hmm. Um, Earl asked for the ingot molds. Uh, what prevents the molten steel that forms the ingots from fusing with the iron ingot molds? Uh, they put what they call the compound called mold wash on it, which I believe was lime based. So that would help uh, prevent sticking. Hmm. Um, Dave Brown asked, did PBNE operate all Bethlehem steel rail operations, including the narrow gauge? Uh, no, the narrow gauge was actually operated independently by steel workers themselves. Uh, the PB and NE would often uh, take a car to uh, the shop, but then the shop had uh, machines like the Tug, which is a, our airport uh, pushback tractor, which Bethlehem modified for locomotive use. And that could actually move vehicles around, sorry, move railroad cars around inside the shops. And they can do the switching fees and have the PB and NE move cars around too. Uh, but by and large, if Bethlehem Steel knew that they were going to have a lot of the switching inside the building, they would try to have their own way of doing it. So the uh, to have steel workers rather than the railroad employees do the switching. But pb and &E did handle hot metal trains and a lot of other uh, carrying throughout the mill. Um, <laughs> Great book. Uh, Bob Wilk has a pair of books. And the late Nevin Yakel wrote a book about the pb and &E, uh, which uh, I would encourage you guys to take a look at their uh, very, uh, uh, very great resources. And long range, I'm hoping we can book on the new gauge too because uh, you had this plant's narrow gauge plus other uh, Bethlehem plant narrow gauge operations throughout the country. And it'll be a really fascinating story to tie all of this together at some point in the future. Hmm. Uh, Earl asked if we're planning on adding a Bethlehem steel uh, logo to the locomotive at all. Uh, we do not plan on adding a logo to the locomotive because it, as far as we can tell, and we're welcome to find corrections, it never had one. It did have the number seven written on the side, so Hopefully when things get back to normal, we'll get that back on there. Um, but yeah, we're trying to keep it as accurate as possible. And I think the last question that we had, um, Trisha asked if our forklift is a Laternio. Say that one more time. Um, Trisha asked if our forklift that was in the video was a Laternio forklift. Uh, that was a leased forklift, uh, which was an Alice Chalmers built for the US Army in 1974. And it was actually repowered with a Deutz engine from a Pennsylvania Railroad uh, maintenance uh, of weight equipment. And uh, that was leased from uh, a Mennonite down in Lancaster County, about a mile away from Shady Maple. And uh, we got an incredible rate on it. 
But last year, uh, uh, the former Huntsman Chemical Plant in Eastern Pennsylvania donated a forklift to us. So we sent the lease unit back, and now we're using a propane powered forklift instead. All right. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, great presentation on a, a nice little piece of uh, history that's in our collection. And thank you, everybody on uh, Facebook that joined us and everybody that's going to watch on our website and YouTube afterwards. Uh, we appreciate everybody coming out, and we encourage everyone to check out NMIH.org. Um, look at our you know, other presentations that are coming up, both there and on our Facebook page. And please visit NMIH.org. There's several different ways that you can help out the museum right now if you're able to. Um, whether it's adopting an artifact, using Amazon Smile, shopping our online gift shop. Um, there's a couple different ways. So we also encourage you all to check those out. Um, you can also buy museum memberships, which is a great way not only to help us out right now, but the memberships are also good from the first day that we reopen the museum finally until a year afterwards. So if you purchase one now, it's going to be good from a year uh, from when you can step foot in the museum again. So thanks everybody for joining us again. Thanks Mike for a great presentation. And we will see you again on Friday afternoon for another talk. Thank you all.